Jacques, thanks so much for coming on and bringing Thank Paco you. as Thank well. Thank you. Yes, this Paco is, is here. This is Paco, my Rottweiler. Well, <laughs> <laughs> sort not of a quite. Rottweiler, right? So I want to talk to you about spending a whole life playing with food. Uh -huh. This started because your folks owned a restaurant in France. Yes. Yes, I mean, you know, it started even before, during the war, but certainly from age five or six, I don't remember anything else but uh, cooking. My parents had a restaurant, and when I left to go into apprenticeship at age 13, actually 1949, I left a restaurant where my mother was the chef. And actually, I had two aunts who had restaurants, I had two cousins, female who had restaurants. I think we had eight restaurants I can think of in the family. Uh, through the year, and I am the first male going into that business in it. So, so much for, you know, they always think the French chef is going to be a male. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's all you did in your family was cook food. Do you remember food, yes. the, the first time you decided, I'm going to make a career out of this? Not really, you know. Uh, the first time I remember during the war, I mean, actually being in a farm and uh, getting the milk from the farmer and thinking, starting thinking in term of food in another way, you know, food as comfort and as something that you have somewhere. Uh, but uh, I had blinders, you know, I mean, uh, when I was a kid, we didn't have television or the internet or not even the movie, not even the telephone. So, so it, was uh, on, it was on the farm, it was in your house. Right. My father was a cabinet maker, my mother had a restaurant, so, you know, I had kind of a blinder, I went in that direction. I didn't really think that I could become, a, I don't know, a lawyer, an architect, or something like this, you know. So I went into that direction, and I have to say that uh, I've been very gratified in life. It's uh, probably better than being a doctor. I don't have to tell you you have cancer, you're going to die. Right. And when you see me, you smile, because I bring happiness to people, you know. You cooked for Charles de Gaulle. Yes. Want to talk about that a little? What was that like? Well, was he a picky eater? Uh, well. Usually you deal with the lady of the house, but from 56 to 59, yes, I was with actually three presidents in France. The government were changing at a rapid pace. It was under the Fourth Republic. And uh, when the goal came, it was the uh, beginning of the 1958. But it was another world of cooking. Paco, what's going on? He's your now? protector. Yeah, he's my protector. So uh, it was another world. I mean, at that time, the sh the chef was really at the bottom of the social scale. So and, it wasn't, uh, you know, the chefs no, as we know today. No, absolutely not, because uh, any good mother would have wanted her child to marry an architect, a lawyer, certainly not a cook, you know. But now we are genius. I don't know what of happened. Of course. But, uh, and have your own shows and everything <laughs> exactly. else. Exactly. But at that point, no, you were in the kitchen. I mean, I served, I was young, I was 21 years old, a chef at that time there, or we were just two, and the other chef, with me, plus an assistant, uh, is actually my dearest friend, and he lives upstate New York here. He followed me when I came to America half a century ago. But uh, we served at that time, like Ivanhoe, Nehru, Tito, mm -hmm. Macmillan, were the head of state. No one ever came. First, no one would call you to go into the dining room and get kudo. That did not exist, period. But uh, and no one ever came. If they came to the kitchen, it was because something was wrong and they came to complain, not something else. Nino, what's your problem? He's definitely <laughs> protecting whatever's going on Okay, there. so I'm going to put you oh. on the floor. You go, you go play. Bye-bye, Paco. <laughs> 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 Come on, Nino. Gloria, call him. Call him. Paco, stop it. Hey, okay. Yes. Come here, baby. Come here. He never done that before. Well, that's because Paco, he's just call, uh, call him, Gloria. Yeah. Paco. Are you okay. No. Okay. Tell sorry. me. No, that's not sorry. at all. I'm sorry. Not at all. So. <laughs> can always edit it, right? Yes, of course. Um, so, cooking for Charles de Gaulle, and you're 21 years old, and it, is it? Are you in the palace? What What happens? What happened is that it, the lady of the house, Madame de Gaulle, you know, which we call Tante Yvonne, you know, Aunt Yvonne at the time. I would meet with her on Monday to do the menu for the week. When it came to state dinner, or, and the Secretary of State or whatever, but when it came to state dinner, important people, as I say, someone like President Eisenhower, then you would deal with the protocol, who would come and uh, discuss the menu with you, the length of the menu, it was a very important menu, whether it was lunch, dinner, one meet, two meet, 
and uh, whether there was restriction. I mean, you are not going to serve, I don't know, pigs. So it was business. This, this was, was not business. a... a no. Do you remember the first dinner that you cooked there? Were yes. you scared to death? Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I came, I was picked up uh, and I was sent. At that point, at that time, I was in the Navy in France. You know, in the, I was called in the Navy at that point I served for the president. And uh, I mean, how did they know you could cook? Because you were cooking well, because, in the Navy? Because I was in the Navy for the, the, the Admiral count and uh, I work in the Plaza Athene, Maxime, I mean big place in Paris mm -hmm. and I suppose, I don't know where they find out, but uh, and I cook for the, a couple of dinner for the Secretary of Treasury uh, here and there and eventually uh, the person who was the Secretary of Treasury, the government changed and he became Prime Minister, President du Conseil, so I moved there with him and so forth. But in any case, they picked me up that day in a car because the election like here, all of a sudden tomorrow morning, this one has won, everything is changed. So they picked me up to go there and I remember I went into the the, the, the market there, uh, there is a beautiful little market near, uh, uh, you know, where the, the, the presidency is in Paris and uh, I uh, I bought veal shop, I remember I had veal shop, I had a gratin of potato, I had a salad and I had a pear or a apple dessert that I did fast, you know, for like eight or ten people. Because you know what happened when the president eat, except for the gold, but as I say, the other one, they say we eat at 12. Well, you're ready at 12. Well, the president is at the Senate or the Chamber of Deputies or whatever. Then he come and finally he come at 1.30. You know, it may be an hour, an hour, an hour late. Oh boy. And the point is that, for example, ex during Gaillard time, he loves souffle, so he wanted souffle. Well, it falls but then, if you're well, not on the time. souffle, he's not going to wait for the souffle. So I had to have three souffle going. One ready to go into the oven, one in the oven, <laughs> one collapsing, you know, to pick it up at the time. He sit down, here is the souffle, you know, so. So it's trial by fire. Right. So you, you go through the stages, at some point you come to America, and at what point do you meet Julia Child and become friends with her? Well, a long, long time ago. I have to add also that when I was with De Gaulle, I did those dinner every week, the Dominican dinner, if you want, Sunday after church, I mean, uh, the, the goal where they're very uh, devout uh, Catholic, and uh, then it was the children, grandchildren, uh, to on Sunday, like 10, 12. So the menu there was for what they liked, and it was decided by Madame de Gaulle. But I have to say that I did my accounting, and we spent a lot of money for reception, whatever. I had to do a special accounting for that, which they pay from their own pocket. You know, it was mm. a question of principle with the, with the general. So, you do have to admire this, you know. Oh, context. absolutely. So you but never uh, slept when you were... Well, not much, no. No. <laughs> it's okay. So when did the friendship start with Julia Child? Well, I arrived here at the end of 1959, work at the Pavilion in New York, and actually I met Julia six months, seven months later. I had a friend of mine called Helen McCauley. Well, first, I had Craig Claiborne just started at the New York Times. Mm -hmm. You know, he became the greatest food critic at the New York Times, and Craig came to the Pavilion to do a, a piece on Pierre Frenet, and he ended up on me as well, and so forth. And through him, I met Helen McCauley, who was the food editor of McCall House Beautiful, so a very feisty uh, Canadian uh, uh, lady, and uh, she kind of became my surrogate mother. She was never married, never had children, telling me, don't wear those stupid socks. You were in France, don't do this, don't do that. Go back to school, do this. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, and she was a very good friend with James Beard. She spoke with James Beard every day for an hour on the telephone too. So through Helen, I met James Beard a few weeks later. And, so you uh, were the creme de la creme right off yeah, the bat. Yeah, but the food world was very, very small. Sure, sure. And in the beginning of 1960, uh, uh, Helen told me, oh, I have that, I want to show you that manuscript. Uh, look, it's a French cooking and all that. I look, I said, gee, that's really good. She said, well, it's a woman who wrote that. She's from Pasadena, California. She's coming to New York next week. Let's cook for her. I say, sure. She said, it's a really big woman with a terrible voice. <laughs> that was Julia. Of course, and I met Julia there, and uh, we became friends uh, for years. And then she lived in Cambridge, and I've been teaching at BU that 31 years now. So uh, each time that I went to, uh, to BU, Either I had breakfast, lunch, or dinner with Julia. We ended up cooking together, uh, doing demonstration for the student. 
And at some point, I remember, I don't know, 20 years ago, I said, we should do a special for PBS on that for summer. We did something called Cooking in Concert at BU. It was a two-hour show, and it was widely looked at. Well, remember, there was no Food Channel Network at the time. And then maybe a couple of years later, we did another Cooking in Concert, and eventually it led to the series that we, we shot together at her house, actually, in Cambridge, you know. Is it true that you do Julia Child's voice? Do you, no, do you I cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> the best for that is Claudine, my daughter. I mean, she knew Julia when she was born, because I knew Julia before Claudine was born, that is. And I remember, and she went to, to, uh, to BU as well, my daughter. And I remember she got into the habit of doing Julia's voice. She would call and, uh, and remember one time I was having dinner with, with Gloria, you know, my wife. Telephone rang and Gloria picked up the telephone. She said, okay, what, what do you want? Su uh, okay, Claudine, what do you want? We're eating with you. And all of a sudden she said, no, no, I'm sorry, Julia. I'll call him. <laughs> First it was Su Claudine <laughs> did her imitation of Julia. And Gloria thought it was, it was actually Julia, and uh, Gloria thought it was Claudine on what, the telephone. What so. made your friendship? What, what worked there? You both know. cooked, of course. We argued together, we yeah. drank together, we ate together, and we disagreed together, but not really on uh, important things, you know. We, we, we uh, agree on what's important, that is the importance of sharing dinner with friends or family, the importance of fresh ingredients. The importance of maybe simplicity in a recipe, you know, the importance of uh, probably taste over decoration, over decoration or aesthetic, uh, all those things, and being together and enjoying a glass of wine, and so, you know. If I said to you fast food, do you say ew or do do you like some fast food? I have two books called Fast Food My Way <laughs> and another one called More Fast Food My Way. So everything is relative to what you call fast food. And you how know? you make it. And how you make it. But your making fast food is not a hot dog, although you said to me you like hot dogs. I love hot dog, yes. How absolutely. do you like a hot dog? Well, you know, I work with the students at BU even now and I tell them, because they all want to do, you know, a big cage in caramel and something very special, you know, unusual with the weirdest ingredient that no one even know what they are. And I thought, okay, let's work in depth rather than, uh, uh, and let's do, we, de, we do a, a BLT sandwich today and a, and a, and a hot dog and, uh, uh, you know, a lobster roll. And they say, are you kidding? Of course I'm kidding. But the point is that you can always do a better a dog, a better anything. There is always a better a dog, a better roll, a better way of roasting it, a better mustard, a better something. I mean, I have my friend Jean Claude, who, as I say, work for me, with me, with uh, the goal. He lives upstate New York, come to see me, and if it's summer, he say, "Let's have a lobster roll at the Clam Shackle, uh, the, the Clam Castle." Which is in Madison. Yeah, the Clam yes. Castle on Madison. I mean, it's a little joint on the Boston Post Road, but. The guy does the lobster roll with the Philadelphia roll, as we did at Howard Johnson. We started at Howard Johnson, mm -hmm. remember our work. Browning it nicely in butter on each side, the open it, fill it up with fresh lobster, just with butter, salt, paper on top of it. And even though my friend is a great chef, too, he will remember that. He said, let's go have a lobster roll. See, you remember that if you have a perfectly, perfectly cooked chicken or a great hamburger or hot dog, you remember that. And you go, it doesn't have to be complicated, you know. What brought you to Connecticut? Why did you raise your daughter in Madison, Connecticut? Well, to tell you the truth, I lived in New York since I came, and I met my wife, upstate New York, skiing, actually. And uh, we uh, had that apartment in New York, and we bought a house upstate New York that I redone. At some point in the 70s, I had a very, very bad accident. I had 14 fracture in the car, car accident, accident. broke my back, my two hip, leg up. I wasn't supposed to live, I wasn't supposed to walk again, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, I did. I still have a drop foot out of this, but uh, we decided to move closer to New York, to be on the coast, as the winter is less taxing than upstate New York. So it was basically the coast of of Connecticut or the coast of Jersey, and even though Gloria was raised in New Jersey, she said, we go to Connecticut, we had friends, we came here, and eventually it was a pretty arbitrary decision. You know, we came and, uh, and we've been here 37 years, 38 years. So Connecticut gets to, to call you a native son almost, even though yeah, you were born in France. Well, even though, but my, I've been working on my accent. 
I think it's purely <laughs> Connecticut, now, don't you think so? I mean, uh, it's uh, not... Very Yankee yeah, in here. Very Yankee, yes. So food is art, and music is art. Right. And that brings me to you drawing little pictures, and now you right. are doing art, and you have a show underway right now. We're taping uh, almost December, but it's, it's underway in Essex. Yeah, Essex. Why did you decide to take the next step and put your drawings of roosters and flowers and such? I don't think it's the next step. I mean, I've been drawing or painting for over 40 years. Uh, yeah, f yeah, more than 40 years, 50 years. And, uh, but I am a good cook, I think, at the risk of sounding uh, presumptuous. Well, it says world-renowned uh, by oh, your yeah, name. Yeah, right, okay. I am not Legend. A, I'm not a great artist. I mean, I'm not a great artist. The point is that, first, I'm not a technician in painting. In cooking, you know, and I'm probably more known for that type of thing, which are the technique that is manipulation, working with your hand, thing that you have to repeat, 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 repeat ad nauseam so that it becomes so much part of yourself that now you can afford to forget it. You know? Now I can cook on television and look at you and think in terms of uh, combination of ingredient, color, texture. I don't have to worry about my hand chopping too because it's so much part of myself that it's part of my DNA if you want. So other professional chefs, you get to go through that thing so that you can afford, as I say, to forget it, so that they become part of yourself. In anything you do, as a painter as well, and I could have spent 10 years or more or less or more in a studio, learn the law of perspective and learn how to mix yellow and blue to do green or what I can do with my thumb or this and that, to learn much more of the intermediate or different primary color too, to really know the media better, but I didn't. So I am a lousy technician when I paint. So I start painting, and it comes out uh, pretty bad. I throw it out, I paint over, whatever. Occasionally, it comes out not bad. So wow, I'm the first one surprised to keep it. <laughs> but uh, I don't have the control uh, in painting that I would have in cooking. In cooking, as I say, at the risk of sounding presumptuous, it would be hard for me to do something uneatable. I would at least to retrieve it to the level at which it will be eatable, because after all of those years of practice, you know your trade well enough. But uh, because I am a technician first, and I believe that whether you are a cabinet maker or a jeweler or a surgeon, for that matter, working with your hand, you first have to be a craftsman and know your trade. Now, if you're only a craftsman, it doesn't take you very far. Although I know many restaurants where the chef is a good craftsman and a relatively lousy cook, the food is okay, but never go to at a certain level. But if you are, you know, Thomas Keller in New York or Jean Georges or Daniel or great chef, you are first a technician, then you have talent. And now that you have talent in your hand, because of that technique, you can take that talent somewhere. And if you put a little bit of love into it, then it's even better. Uh, if so you're you work, having fun with your art. Yes, uh, fun, but I mean, you know, you can work five years in a studio, as I said, and step outside, you're a good craftsman, and do one painting after another. Does that make you an artist? Not really, but you're a good craftsman. Now, if you happen to have talent, however, then if you don't have anything in your hand as a craftsman to show it, it's hard to, uh, to do something with it, you know, so you need both. What do you think of all these cooking shows on TV? The Iron Chef and the lot. Uh, are, are Hell's they, Kitchen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, what, do you, what do you think Well, you know, this? I was someone on, uh, uh, at the Food and Wine Festival somewhere not too long ago, and he, uh, a food historian, and he said there is 407 cookery show on television. Frankly, I don't know whether it's accurate. It seems excessive to seems me. Seems like but, it uh, might be correct. <laughs> yes. But uh, even if there is only 200, it's just amazing. I mean, the way, the way food has changed in America, uh, I mean, when I came here in the supermarket, there was only one salad, so the iceberg. There was no leek, no shallot, none of the oriental vegetable, different type of oil, vinegar. Look at the supermarket. I've never been as beautiful today as uh, in the last 50 years for me. And then people say no one cook anymore. Well, if no one cook, I mean, what do they do with the stuff at the end of the week? Someone must be cooking somewhere. But it's a different way of cooking than we used to. And, you know, cookery show, I do things I cook. Basically, that's what I do. That's still what I do. And I'm sure many people look at my show and say, that guy is really boring. I mean, after a while. I don't think and, so. Well, but, and some love me. And some don't look at show 
they look at it for a ten haven't minute we, or other thing. Haven't we come full circle because now we're organic cooking and we're we're using what we have in the garden. Uh -huh. Isn't that what you did in France yeah. in <laughs> 40 Well, even in America. Yeah. In America there was farm. I mean, even when I came 50 years ago. And then they started to change in America after the Second World War, TV dinner and so forth. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s already, with women liberation, organic garden, you know, health food still starting, changing at that point. But you know, in the last 30 years, we've done, uh, 20 years, 25 years, we've done over 30,000 books on dieting and losing weight. And we are now 40% fatter than we were 30 years ago. So that doesn't seem to work too well. But then we are going back to local food, we're going back to farmer, we're going back to uh, uh, organic food, we're and all of that is great. I always say in a jazz that my father and my mother were organic gardeners. Well, the word organic did not exist to start with, and, uh, but chemical fertilizer did not exist, and fungicide, insecticide, pesticide, all that did not exist. So everyone was an organic farmer, I mean, 50, 60 years ago. So we're going back to this, but we are always going back to this. We always do things with the extreme here. So, and sometimes now that is the extreme. I've been to restaurants where you know, they introduce you the carrot. I say, that carrot name is Sarah, and she was born on the 7th of May. Please, give me a break, right? give me right. the carrot. <laughs> Talk about this book. This is your latest book of about, what, 26, 27 books have you written over yes. a lifetime? Well, I have 3,000 pictures of technique in there, and that book is an old book. It just came out last week. But how to cut a chicken, how to do all of how that How to stuff. do a caramel cage, how to make an omelet, how to peel an asparagus, how to sharpen your how knife. How to fold a napkin, even. How to fold a napkin, to all of those things, which, as I say, are very difficult to explain in words. But I did a book called La Technique, which came out in 1976, which is in there, and a continuation with another book, La Méthode. Then I did a book called The Art of Cooking in the 80s. All of those books are combined in that book now, because, as I said, I don't cook the same way that I did at that point. That's why we have retouched some of the recipe. But the technique themselves, which is what I'm interested in doing here, uh, are the same. You know, I even went to fish in my pond here and uh, went to get frog to show you how to take the skin out oh, of frog. Wow. <laughs> Not that people may do it, but if you want to do it, it's there. You know, so. so you're going to be 77 years old. Right. What is there left to do? And I'm hoping you're going to say a ton. Are there more books? Is there another show? I would love to learn how to play the piano. Yeah, I probably will never do You know, that. somebody else said that to <laughs> me. Yeah. I like Why the piano? The piano? I don't know. I, I love the piano to start with. I love classical music, but you know, in the kitchen, the stove we call the piano. When you work the piano, you work the stove. Interesting. Is yeah. that a French term, or is yeah. that? Yeah, it's a French term. You know, working the piano is working the stove. But there is always more things to do. You know, I uh, I hope next year to tape another series. I've done thirteen series of twenty-six show mm -hmm. with KQED, you know, the PBS station in San Francisco, that I tape my show. And uh, with my granddaughter, Shori, and uh, my daughter, Claudine, I've done several series with her, and it's always great to cook with the family. I would want to cook with my wife, Gloria, but she absolutely hates the television and the camera, so she will never come with Does me. Does she cook with you, by the way? Oh, yeah, yeah, we cook. 47 years of marriage, so we've cooked together. I mean, yeah, for 47 years, but usually, when she cooks in the kitchen and I come in, it's not like she tells me, darling, what do you think? Usually she'll tell me, don't touch anything. <laughs> you know, so, uh, Is she your best critic? I mean, do, oh, yeah, she, she'll, she'll tell you, the, uh, I don't yeah, like my that. My wife will be a very good critic, yes. And the kids are the best critic. Mm -hmm. She says, yeah, this is disgusting, <laughs> or whatever. Biggest flop you ever had cooking? See, the beauty of being a professional chef, I could call cooking the art of recovery or the art of adjustment or the art of compensation. You always kind of retrieve it to do something with it. Like you do a, I don't know, a jelly roll, to do a bûche de Noël, you know, one of those roll cake too, and you leave it three minutes too long, or it dries out outside, you start rolling it, it crack. Or you cut it into strip, you pack it up, you put the cream in between, you do something else, still do something with you it. You just kind of glue it together differently. Yeah, right, one way or the other. Well, why didn't I know that? Jacques, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. And Thank you very much for, for having me here. I didn't let you say anything. I'm sorry. This is yeah. about you. Oh, well, it's thanks about you. Thanks very much. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you.